My name is Markus Schultz. I'm uh, one of uh, Paul's former uh, PhD students. I'm probably a big disappointment for Paul since I voluntarily dropped out of the philosophy of science community and instead became a, a professor at the business school. However, there were times I had um, higher aspirations and that was especially at the day when I finished my PhD and uh, I remember a chat I had with Paul after one or two gin and tonics and uh, I said, Paul, look, uh, I'm uh, done with my PhD now and uh, you're going to retire soon um, so who's going to be your successor as a chair for the philosophy of science at the University of Hanover and um, Paul said, uh, well other than you Marcus, well you never said that but um, <laughs> he came up with another, uh, immediately he came up with a, a brief list of people, um, one of uh, the persons in the room today and this is our next speaker and I'm um, delighted to introduce our next speaker who is uh, Heather Chang. Heather Chang is, um, has uh, a lot of common with Paul Heuning. They both graduated in, uh, oh, well, they both studied uh, theoretical physics before they decided to do something even uh, less applied, namely uh, philosophy of science. All right, so um, our next speaker, Heather Chang, um, graduated from Caltech in an independent studies program with an emphasis on theoretical physics and philosophy. and. Uh, only four, four years later, in uh, 1993, Heather finished his PhD in philosophy at Stanford with a dis uh, dissertation titled uh, Measurement uh, and the Disunity of Quantum Physics. Uh, then, after um, serving as a lecturer, reader, and senior lecturer, and finally as a professor for uh, philosophy of science at UCL in 2010, um, Heather Chang got appointed as the Hans Rousing Professor of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge. Um, Professor Chang is author of many research contributions from, uh, at the reason of time, uh, I can only name a few. Um, he is the author of the book, Is Water H2O, Evidence, Realism and Pluralism, uh, published uh, by Springer in 2012. In addition, um, he is the author of the book published by the Oxford University Press in 2004, uh, Inventing Temperature Measurement and the Scientific Progress. Uh, additionally, and I found this very charming, um, Professor Chang is also um, the co-editor of the book An Element of Controversy, The Life of Chlorine in Science, Medicine and Technology and War. Um, the book is actually a collection of original work for undergraduate students at the University College of London. Um, in addition um, to his apparent talent as an author, uh, Professor Chang seems to be a good networker and a servant of his community since he's also co-founder of the Society for Philosophy of Science and Practice and he also currently serves as the president of the British Society uh, for the History of Science. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I could go on uh, for a little while but um, I shouldn't. Um, I guess from my introduction um, you have already understood that Paul was true when he said like four years ago Heather Chang is one of the most interesting and gifted philosophers um, of science as our of our time. Heather, the um, floor is you and very excited to hear your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Marcus for that introduction. I'm just going to pull up my presentation, if I can. <laughs> yes, please. There too many things to close. I, we need a different method. Looks right. Yeah. Thank you, Simon, and also, obviously, for inviting me here, uh, as well as Helmut and everyone else. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here uh, at this event, honoring Paul's uh, great career in philosophy of science. I'm a relatively new member of this Paul family. Uh, I only met him in 2012, I think, but the first time I came across him was much earlier. This was in 1991, 
when I was doing my PhD at Stanford, as uh, Marcus just mentioned. And we were looking for a new professor of philosophy of science. Um, Nancy Cartwright had just left for London, and Peter Gallison was about to leave as well. These were the two people I had gone to Stanford to study with, and I wasn't done yet. So it was clearly necessary for me that we get a good person. And they did this very American thing of uh, having a student member of the committee that employed this new professor. So I think they took pity on me because I, all my people were leaving and they put me on that committee. And with my relatively you know, novice, uh, untrained eye, I looked through the applications and it was very clear to me that the man to get was this someone I'd never heard of called Paul Heuningen Hune. And I mean, nobody could pronounce his name to begin with. <laughs> so we called him Mr. H. H. Which is actually better in English, right? Because so it would be hair ha ha in German. <laughs> but anyway, I argued very strongly for Paul and the rest of the committee was not convinced. And uh, they said, oh, Kuhn, he works on Kuhn, he's passé, who wants to work on Kuhn? And I thought, I'd really like a supervisor who works on Kuhn. Never mind. So that didn't work. Uh, in the end, they didn't hire anybody. Because obviously, having decided that Paul wasn't good enough, then nobody, <laughs> by definition, was good enough. And then they went on uh, next year again, and they uh, didn't invite me to join the committee again. <laughs> Then I actually met Paul in 2012 at one of the Philosophy of Science Association conferences. And this really was the classic junior scholars conference fantasy, right? In which you give a talk and some famous person that you never met comes up to you and says how great it was and, and you are the best thing since himself. Uh, <laughs> slice bread, whatever you want. And this is precisely what Paul did. I had given a talk about uh, realism uh, critiquing status bacillus's treatment of caloric theory. Anyway, th this really was such a wonderful event and having got Paul's characteristically enthusiastic reaction, which many of you know, I thought, you know, I I'm gonna make it in this business. I wasn't sure until then. <laughs> so something I've always really appreciated in Paul is, well, it is Mertonian virtue of disinterestedness, right, in the way he supports people, because I had never studied with Paul, despite my best attempts. I had never uh, even worked or visited the same place as him. There's no formal connection whatsoever. He's never owed me money or anything. <laughs> We come from different continents. I, I come from two continents, neither of which is his. Um, so the way he purely appreciates quality, I like to think. Otherwise, it's completely inexplicable why he thinks I'm any good. So thank you very much, Paul, for all you've done for me. And now I'm going to take the president's example, take my jacket off. And today, uh, in this academic part of my presentation, what I would like to do is focus on Kuhn and Paul's work on Kuhn, because that is obviously one of the key areas of Paul's contribution to philosophy. Also because Kuhn and Kuhn's work affected me deeply in my own academic life, and that was partly through Paul's interpretation of it. Whenever I think of Paul, I remember this stunning foreword by Kuhn to Reconstructing Scientific Revolutions, which, which Marcel has already quoted. Where did Marcel go? Oh, hello. And uh, there's another part which I always remember where Kuhn says after Paul came to visit MIT, I quote, I rapidly discovered that Heuningen knew my work better than I and understood it very nearly as well as I. That's vintage Kuhn, the way he puts that. And then he goes on to say, no one, myself included, speaks with as much authority about the nature and development of my ideas. 
What I'd like to suggest today is that taking Paul's reading of Kuhn and taking that to its logical conclusion gives us a productive way of going beyond Kuhn that is actually true to Kuhn's own spirit. So the overall line of argument I want to advance today is quite simple. I want to argue that incommensurability should lead to pluralism if we can remove a certain prejudice that stands in the way. And from this pluralist point of view, incommensurability can be a useful and beneficial thing that we can celebrate instead of always try to avoid. So here I must stress that I'm talking about pluralism rather than relativism. Relativism I take as involving a refusal or inability to make a judgment. In Kuhn's view, uh, science was always an enterprise of making judgments, despite not having a fixed algorithm for it. And pluralism also, like Kuhn's view of science, is not a renunciation of judgment. Pluralism is simply the position that we should have more than one system in place. We should have multiple ones. Uh, I'm, I'll come back to that, obviously, in more detail. But for now, I'll just give you a very brief definition of pluralism as I mean it, which is the position that it is beneficial to maintain and cultivate multiple systems of knowledge, multiple systems of practice, as I called it recently, even in one given field of science. And that's contrary to Kuhn, and that's where I want to begin. And another obvious qualification to all of that is that, especially in the present company, I'm not expecting to say anything new about incommensurability itself, but I want to focus on its implications. So let me now uh, start with the prejudice that I just spoke of it before, right, that stands in the way of incommensurability leading to pluralism. This prejudice is what has been called Kuhn's paradigm monopoly thesis. This is a phrase that I've actually seen Martin Carrier using uh, in one of his papers, among other people. And uh, as many of you know very well, Lakatos, Laudan, and others have identified this assumption in Kuhn, and they have criticized criticized Kuhn for it. And this, indeed, is one aspect of Kuhn's work that I have a major disagreement with, and there are not many, actually. I mean, as Paul points out, Kuhn's stance on this issue becomes quite moderated, starting with uh, what Paul calls his 1969 papers. But I think there, there is still plenty of it, strong enough uh, remnant of it, in his later work. So I'll talk for the moment as if he still subscribes to the basic idea that in a normal phase of science, there is in each given field just one paradigm on which there is complete consensus or very nearly complete consensus. And the first thing to say, the immediate problem with this paradigm monopoly thesis is a descriptive one. Simply, there are lots of cases in which it doesn't seem to be true, in which science has operated and progressed in a rather normal way without such monopoly. So um, I mentioned, well, Marcus has mentioned my recent book uh, in, in which um, I give three major case studies. And in, in the experience of writing this book, I've encountered two studies, uh, chapters two and three here, uh, treating atomic molecular theory through most of the 19th century and electrochemistry through most of the 19th century. Uh, these cases, I, I, I realized, uh, were instances of science being extremely disunified, yet unquestionably scientific. And the case dealt with in chapter one, uh, ch the chemical revolution, phlogiston going to oxygen, I mean, that's normally considered a classic instance of a Kuhnian paradigm change, even there I found the story was much more complicated. I, I can go on about phlogiston if you want, but it's better for everyone that I don't today. <laughs> now, there are many instances, many other instances uh, like this, including the long-running competition between the wave and particle theories of optics, the clash between uniformitarianism and catastrophism in geology, uh, 
the material and kinetic theories of heat. I mean, all of that is very well known without any particular digging up of unfamiliar history. And then if you do a little bit of digging up, as I do, we find a great deal more to consider. For example, the idea of positive material cold alongside the familiar theories of heat. The idea of the separate existence of optical, calorific, and chemical radiation, which was a main stream of 19th century physics, not a fringe idea. There's also the cogency that we note of the caloric theories, and again, the phlogiston theories, the ether theories, and so on and so on. Even classical mechanics existed in several versions, as we all know. And even the history of something like special relativity is a long history of dissent and suppression. And special relativity, which today only crazy people oppose, we think, has actually long ceased to be an active research field, much like the geometric optics case that Kuhn discusses. So what do we have? Well, I mean, I have to make one concession, which is that, yes, normal science does exist, like Popper once said particularly the kind of attitude that makes one think that there is a paradigm monopoly does exist. But it is mostly the attitude of those who have only been taught one thing and don't even know that there are many, any other ways of thinking or practicing science. So surely there are people like that and there are plenty of them, but they do not constitute the whole of science. And this is the case even when there's only one dominant paradigm. We often find other people who don't quite go along with it. So let's not mistake dictatorship for consensus, not to mention universality. Now, I've given you a very compressed uh, version of what, it, what is a long historical argument, but even this quick survey is sufficient to make one wonder. Given this... Uh, fact that the paradigm monopoly thesis is descriptively wrong enough, why did Kuhn hold on to it as such an important historiographical framing device? Right? What was in it for him? And as one often finds with Kuhn, the normative versus descriptive boundary is neither tidy nor fixed. I once asked Kuhn about this. Uh, th this is a long story which I'm not going to get into, uh, in which I, as a struggling undergraduate student randomly wrote Thomas Kuhn and he replied and since then I got to know him and, and did have a chance to ask a few questions. A relevant part of this story is how Paul then later went to Kuhn's archive and found my letters to him there. That was very surreal. But Kuhn when questioned about this said basically this is how science works young man. Right, meaning it wouldn't work otherwise. It wouldn't work, at least not as well as it does if you didn't have that paradigm monopoly. So I think there was an underlying normative argument, but what is it? And I've often tried to find it. Uh, in Kuhn, there, there are some uh, hints, certainly, but I mean, you could imagine that the argument is psychological. That, that a scientist is simply not capable of thinking in more than one way. But I think Kuhn himself actually is a great counterexample to this. When he would go back to history and master strange things like Aristotelian physics and come back to the present and think about 20th century physics, no problem. I mean, not no problem. It's hard to do, but it, it can be done. Or is the argument economic, that, that we as society just cannot afford to support multiple paradigms at once. Well, we heard about the thousand string theorists. If we can waste, no, not waste, uh, if we can devote that much resource to one branch of one kind of physics, why not split it into two or three? I think in modern society, we can afford quite a bit more than uh, just one paradigm in each field. Or is the argument definitional, meaning you don't call something science unless it has this paradigm monopoly, but that is obviously question begging. So I, I think in the end, the normative arguments, at least the ones I can imagine, are unconvincing. And moreover, I think paradigm monopoly is not necessary 
in order to give us what Kuhn thinks is good in normal science. I believe that normal science, in the sense of puzzle-solving activity without debates over fundamentals, can be done without a complete consensus. So first of all, the majority of the community can carry on in that way while tolerating a small number of mavericks on the fringe. More productively, I think that a full-fledged pluralism is quite compatible with what Kuhn sees as the advantage of normal science and in addition bring other benefits. So in Kuhnian terms, why not maintain, as you have in the revolutionary situations, several paradigms at once, within each of which people can behave like normal scientists. But I'm getting ahead of my story now. So let me pull back. That's where I'm going. But before I go there, I would like to ask more carefully, what happens if we reject Kuhn's paradigm monopoly thesis, but keep the rest of Kuhnian insights on scientific development. And what I want to argue is that this is something we can achieve best on the basis of Paul's reading of Kuhn. So let's go to that briefly. Briefly because I suspect most of you know it already. So here's uh, Howard Sankey and Paul's introduction to their incommensability book. Um, the introduction is Sankey and Hoening and Nuna. Uh, the book is the reverse. This is from the introduction. And let me uh, just, just read this with you. Paul, Hoening and Hune interprets the image of sorry, world change in a neo-Kantian fashion, which is uh, something of a dirty word for Howard, I, I imagine. In his book, Reconstructing Scientific Revolutions, Hoening and Hune argues that Kuhn's metaphysical stance is in fact a dynamic Kantian position. And because of the conceptual variations you can have in being neo-Kantian rather than Kant himself, the world that changes in transition between theories is the phenomenal world of scientists rather than the world in itself which is unaffected by such change. While incommensable theories may refer to some of the same things, the things to which they refer are not mind-independent objects. So I know this is controversial among many people. Uh, I, I don't want to go into the controversy now. I just want to say this is more or less my take on Kuhn as well. And uh, I think we can do a lot of good things with it. And if anyone doubted whether Paul was serious about this, I mean, we only have to look at the first big chunk of reconstructing scientific revolutions, right? Which opens with the Kant-Kuhn comparison on the matter of the world and sich versus the phenomenal world, right? So now I'm ready to give you the main story I want to give you today. First, I want to argue that incommensibility leads quite straightforwardly to pluralism. Now there's the line again. If one can escape from the grip of the paradigm monopoly thesis or a, a monistic kind of realism, which, which some other people have, although Kuhn didn't have that. So uh, you'll remember from the uh, incommensibility book of Paul and Howard that they make a distinction between semantic and methodological incommensibility. So let me take the methodological first. And I think methodological incommensibility quite straightforwardly leads to epistemic pluralism, right? Because there are different methodological standards, uh, each of which in the typical Kuhnian situations underpins science well enough. So what would be the grounds for saying that we should pick one or the other rather than have all of them? What stands in the way of that is the paradigm monopoly thesis. So if you take that away, then you have pluralism of the epistemic kind. Now, uh, I have given a general argument for epistemic pluralism in the last chapter of the book of mine that I just uh, mentioned. I'm not going to try to give all of that argument here. But um, I think it's just worth noting that there is a straight line from incommensurable, methodological incommensurability to epistemic kind of pluralism. Then what about semantic incommensurability? I'm also not going to say very much about this, but for very different reasons. 
Perhaps I agree with those people, at least in part, who feel that nothing much good can come from semantic incommensability and you should just try to argue that it doesn't exist or find ways of getting rid of it when you find it. But if semantic incommensability is your enemy, it is an enemy of whom we have had a vastly ex uh, overblown fear. Because I think semantic incommensability has been exaggerated both in its extent and its importance. I mean, if planet before and after Copernicus is the best example you can come up with, that's not scary. <laughs> you can immediately go to the language in which each and every planet is named and identified and then you're done. So, of course, there are more serious examples of this, but I think on the whole things have been exaggerated and I think it was a mistake for Kuhn to focus so much on the semantic, especially referential semantic uh, aspects of incommensibility in his later years. Now comes uh, what I've termed phenomenal incommensibility. This is curiously left out in the methodological versus uh, semantic division. You could think of this as a consequence of the other two, but that's immaterial for now. Uh, the point is that um, in Paul's interpretation of Kuhn, right, the so-called plurality of phenomenal worlds thesis is the first major aspect that's treated in reconstructing scientific revolutions, and I think rightly so. And if you accept phenomenal incommensibility in which the change of paradigm brings on different actual phenomena, then you get stuck if you want or for me, it's quite a nice consequence that you can have a semi-metaphysical pluralism. Now, all these I'll discuss in more detail, if you'd like, in the question period. But there are a few more things I'd like to um, point out about the relation between incommensibility and pluralism. So first is a consolation for maybe Kuhn himself, or maybe others who want to stick with what Kuhn said. As I express it here, a plurality of paradigms is not really much worse than what Kuhn already allows. And by that, I, I have two things in mind. First, I mean, he does allow that um, in the period of scientific, scientific revolutions, you do have multiple paradigms, and not everything is a disaster. People are still doing science during the revolutionary periods. They're making progress, making discoveries. So why are we so afraid of that state persisting a bit more? And then the other point is that Kuhn does, of course, acknowledge plurality diachronically as you go from one paradigm to another. So if, you, if it's fine to go from A to B to C, why is it so bad to go quickly? between the same alternatives or at the same time entertain them. So I don't think it's really so much of a departure from what Kuhn says. Another point I want to uh, stress here briefly is the matter of so-called Kuhn laws, right? Uh, the idea that there's some knowledge that gets lost when scientists go from one paradigm to another, and Kuhn takes this as an in inevitable consequence of his view of scientific development. And I say, why, why do we have to put up with it? I mean, if we're going to lose some knowledge by reject, discarding an old paradigm, why don't we keep that old paradigm so we don't lose that knowledge? Of course, if you subscribe to the monopoly thesis, then you can only have one at a time. So you have to discard the old one. But I'm saying you, we don't have to. And in fact, if you look at the actual practice of science, very often the old paradigms are kept. Why else do we torture every student of physics with Newtonian mechanics before we teach them anything new? Because it's still good and it still serves the functions that it always did and so on, right? So uh, there's something I called uh, conservationist pluralism. Uh, Right, it's this attitude that if there was a system of science that was really good, 
most likely it will still remain good in its own domain. So we should keep it, otherwise we'll lose knowledge. One more thing um, I want to uh, point out is actually a large part of my general argument for pluralism, which is what I call the interactive aspect. So um, in, in my book, I distinguish two kinds of benefits that you can have pluralism. One I call uh, benefits of toleration, right? By having various alternatives, you can get different outcomes from them. The other I call bene benefits of interaction, right? This is where pluralism really becomes pluralism rather than just some weird version of relativism. The point is that you keep multiple systems and then they will interact and they can do so in a productive way, which you can never get if you have the paradigm monopoly kind of configuration, right? So that's against Kuhn. Why is it beyond Lakatos, as I put it? Because Lakatos, of course, acknowledged that you should have plural research programs at once, but in a weird way, only so that you can run the competition and kill all the programs except the one that wins. That's not real pluralism, right? That's a, just a temporary state. So what I argue here is that you can really have productive interactions, and um, there are many ways of doing it. I've distinguished three different ways. One is actually competition. Even if you're actually just having a competition, that will affect the way each system behaves. And then there are other two other modes which I've distinguished, uh, which I've called co-optation and integration. Co-optation is when one system takes over good things from another system and makes its own use. So, for example, when Lavoisier looked around over to England and saw what Priestley and Cavendish and others were doing and picked out the phlogisticated air from Priestley, turned it into oxygen, picked out inflammable air from Cavendish, turned it into hydrogen, said, bingo, I have the composition of water and everything else. That's a brilliant case of co-optation, which would have been better for science if we had acknowledged the sources, but that's another issue. What I call integration, uh, this is close to actually what Sandy Mitchell does in her argument for pluralism. Um, this is when you've got a problem to solve, not one system will solve it, so you pull different aspects of different systems together, make a hybrid that will do the job. And Mitchell talks about the study of social insect communities. My favorite example is GPS, the Global Positioning System which is done by flying satellites up there using Newtonian mechanics, putting atomic clocks on the satellites, which, which run by quantum mechanics, and then you have to correct those atomic clocks by using special and general relativity, and then the signals are beamed down to you who think this is like the flat Earth, and you drive with that. So um, it's a wonderful example of a system which pulls together elements of very different systems uh, and satisfies the need at hand. So this is the real payoff from pluralism, which we can get from rejecting the normative version of the paradigm monopoly thesis. Now, there are just two more things. How much time do I have? Yeah, good. Two more things I want to do before I close. One uh, is to talk about the relation to realism, which I know at least Howard will want me to uh, address. So one key implication of incommensibility and pluralism is, of course, on the question of scientific realism. And what I want to argue is that Paul's kind of neo-Kantian reading of Kuhn is very, very compatible with a position that I've advocated which I call active realism. Now, what the hell is that, you ask? So this is how I defined it. Uh, what I call active scientific realism is simply a general commitment to seek out contact with reality and to learn from it as much as possible, consciously, systematically, and precisely. Now, if you put it that way, I mean, who could object to this? And that's exactly what I want. I want you to think this is obvious. The more difficult step is to convince you think, to think that this is what we should mean by realism. 
rather than what I've called here standard realism, which uh, involves the belief that accepted scientific theories reach the truth, especially with the capital T, right? at least in an approximate or partial way. So what I call active realism, I think, is quite compatible with, with the Kantian, Kuhnian view on reality. And you might say, well, what does this guy mean by reality? And here I, I, I can't give you the whole discourse, but it's what I call the pragmatist operational sense of it. Uh, and quite a brazen definition of reality I'll give you is whatever is not subject to your own will. And here I'm drawing from people like William James who talk about the resistance that reality offers. And this is precisely what Paul and uh, Howard mentioned and Paul actually believes, right? So let me go back to their incommensurability book here. So here's again from the introduction where they say the realist holds that the entities to which the terms of a theory refer exist independently of the theory and that the world investigated by natural science is an objective reality which exists independently of human thought. So it's a two-part definition of realism. And the way I want to take realism takes the um, blue bit and discards the black bit, right? So yes, there is an objective reality which exists independently of human thought, which is just my definition of reality. But it doesn't follow from that that the entities, sorry, to which the terms of a theory refer exist independently, right? Because that implies that the conceptual part of the entity, as we conceive it, is also mind independent. And this is the thesis that Paul exactly denies and Howard argues about. So we're taking one half of Howard's realism and going with Paul saying reality is the source of resistance, but it is itself inarticulable. And here's a quotation, the smoking gun. This is actually the very end of reconstructing scientific revolutions, right? Where he goes, we can never subtract the genetically subject-sided from a phenomenal world in such a way as to permit our undistorted view of the purely object-sided of absolute reality or of the world in itself. The concrete properties of the world in itself are rather inaccessible. Though we feel the effects of these properties in the resistance of the in the world offers to our epistemic efforts, we aren't in a position to grasp this resistance as it is in itself. So in preparing for this, I made up my own slogan, right? So it's about this inaccessibility, which goes, success is our only access to reality. And there's an echo of Ian Hacking there, which I'm not going to go into right now. So that, that's, that's one of the two last things I wanted to do. The other, as I put it here, is to learn to celebrate incommensurability. From the point of view of uh, pluralism and active realism, I ask, what is the proper attitude that we should take towards incommensurability? And let me just go through this briefly. I think if we can achieve methodological incommensurability, meaning have different systems of science which use genuinely different methods from each other, we should be happy. Because that means that we've just expanded the toolbox of science. Similarly, I think even semantic incommensurability could be celebrated uh, in the way that um, multiple meanings may aid in the construction of multiple meaningfulness but I don't want to go into that greatly. There is a drawback to semantic incommensurability, even for pluralism, of course, if it gets in the way of effective communication. That's a good challenge we need to overcome, but not, not an impossible one. And then the phenomenal incommensurability, I think, should again be celebrated. And we shouldn't talk so much about Kuhn's world changes, but about an enrichment of the phenomenal world. So here's Paul again in this uh, relatively lesser known paper uh, which he published in Studies in HPS, where he goes, but in which sense was there phlogiston in the world of pre-revolutionary chemistry 
And he says, well, it was there in the same sense as there are electrons in the world of today's physics, or there is evolution in the world of today's biology. What does he mean by that? This is from his paper about uh, Kuhn and chemical revolution. I don't want to read this whole thing, but he says, you know, the way 19th or 20th century chemists experimentally and theoretically deal with oxygen is not in principle different from the way 18th century chemists deal with phlogiston. And I, if, if you're coming to the PSA this year, I'm going to put my neck out uh, in that forum and give a talk called If Phlogiston, If You Can Spray Phlogiston, Is It Real? And I'm going to answer yes. Uh, echoing Paul, but he's worried, right? He says, but there's an obvious objection to this. The 18th century chemists were wrong. <laughs> and he says, of course, I cannot really deal with this objection to the extent that it deserves. And I hope I have been dealing with that on Paul's behalf, and that, that's in the first chapter of my book, among other places. So, overall, I think incommensurability can be taken as an achievement of human diversity and creativity. It's an achievement because I don't mean randomly producing mutually incommensurable systems. I mean producing successful ones that are mutually incommensurable. So um, let me finish now by doing two things. One, uh, I'm going to give Paul the last word, and then I'm going to give him two gifts. The last word is this the end of that paper. He says, we may have learned with difficulty how to live with that fact that one, the one true religion or the one true culture, one's own of course, does not exist. It may be, I'm not saying that it is the case, it may be that also the idea of the one reality, the one we're used to of course, must be abandoned. But the learning process required here will not be an easy one. And you know, when Paul says something's hard, it will be hard. However, I would like to think that I have been engaged in just such a learning process ever since the time when I came to learn about Paul Heuning and Hühne and his work. I hope he will now agree that such a learning process is an easier one than he had imagined in 1990, and at any rate, a worthwhile one, even if it remains just as difficult. So now the two gifts. Um, these are uh, instances of Kuhn laws that I found uh, that cons consist in gold and silver as befitting such an occasion. Now it, it's unfortunately only going to be pictures of gold and silver, but here we go. So what is this? This is just a test tube containing a, a graphite a cathode and gold anode, and we're electro electrolyzing uh, subjecting under electrolysis, salt water, just saturated NaCl solution. And you can see from the minus side, hydrogen gas comes out, and you want to know what comes out on the right-hand side here, which is the plus side. And here I want to show you what happens. Can you see that? Yeah. So that's the gold wire nicely dissolving away yeah. with the application of two little batteries from the outside. And uh, this is referred to uh, very briefly in a, a paper of 1801 I found, but not anywhere else. And if you increase the voltage, you might think more stuff like that happens, but no. The gold stops dissolving when you go over about 3.5 volts, and instead you just get chlorine gas coming out of the gold wire, and then you have to stop, because otherwise you'll gas yourself. This is the second gift. This is a silver tree. Now, uh, such things are still made routinely, but usually by applying an external voltage, this is all spontaneous. So what do you do? You just dip a copper wire, that this is a, a, a plastic envelope with a dark background underneath, underneath, and it's filled with a solution of silver nitrate. That's all. So you stick 
the copper wire into the solution. What happens is immediately it's covered by silver because the nitrate likes copper better than it likes silver. So it'll cough up the silver it had originally and take some copper from the wire. And this was known to Newton, it was known to medieval people. You might think this is it, right? But if you keep it there, the silver continues to grow on the silver. And you get lots of very nice patterns. So these are the two gifts. Uh, the tree, I think, is also a symbol of the refined systematicity that Paul's latest book expounds. So I've taken up enough of your time. Let me stop here and thank you, Paul, and thank you all very much. Well, uh, thank you very much for your talk. And um, you challenged Paul. I've seen he was writing down things um, all the time. Um, and I guess the first question is to Paul Oining today. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, Hasek, very much for this talk and also the nice incidences and uh, our first encounter. I still remember it very vividly. So first of all, what you say against the paradigm monopoly thesis, I must say, I must admit that really I never emancipated from Kuhn, myself, uh, because I didn't have the resources. And you do have the resources because you are a historian of science. And you looked into cases from which you get a feeling what a functioning natural science would look like that is not bound by a monopoly of a paradigm. I mean, I have a physics background, and when I did physics, of course, it was always a monopoly, more or less, mm -hmm. at least in a rough sense. Yeah. Also, of course, I knew classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, but still. So from my experience, and then I simply, it, it was plausible what Kuhn said, and I simply followed him because I thought, well, this guy knows much more history than I do, mm -hmm. but I must say I never critically uh, scrutinized it at all. So I'm completely open for that, and I think it's very useful. I mean, why did I then ad adhere rather to, to Kuhn? Because the f arguments that I knew from Feyerabend against it, mm. they th I thought were, were lousy. They were just not good enough. <laughs> and therefore, Feyerabend couldn't right. convince me. Right. And then I saw, so Feyerabend can't convince me. And I see Kuhn's argument that sounds pretty plausible. But I'm completely open for the discussion. And it's very interesting to open it up a little. And, and you're doing a, a perfect job. I mean, I, I often said to you and also to other people, you are the real successor of Paul Feyerabend in our community. That's really true. Okay, and the second thing is when you say semantic incommensurability is exaggerated. Uh, I mean, for many, many years, I objected to that more or less. But now, as a matter of fact, uh, I think uh, within the last 12 months, I changed my mind. Oh. Uh, yes. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, you, you're surprised. Wow. Yes, uh, yeah. And the point is, uh, in, a com in a very different context, in the con context of agnotology, do you mm. know what agnotology mm. is? Yeah, of course, of course you know it, I'm sorry. It's, uh, it's uh, the philosophy of ignorance. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm now involved in the philosophy of ignorance. You should know that the center of philosophy of ignorance is Hanover, because <laughs> we have two philosophers, two philosophers who deal with the philosophy of ignorance, Thorsten Willow and me, and, uh, and in other centers there's only one philosopher of ignorance. And anyway, so uh, I had to give in Paris a talk on ignorance, and then I discovered, because I wanted to see what the... Uh, connections between incommensurability and ignorances, and then I discovered one should make really a distinction between two kinds of incommensurability, which I now call weak incommensurability and strong incommensurability, which is not very descriptive. But the point is, and that also may stop a discussion that's been going on for decades, namely that Kuhn said incommensurability always involves these communication problems because of the shift in the lexicon. And many, especially historians, said, well, that's just not what we observe. And you said exactly the same about the planets. Look at it. There are no communication problems. And now I discovered that it's not enough to refer to the uh, differences in the structure of the lexicon in order to conclude from that communication problems. It's just not true. Yeah. But there are cases, and it's a minority of cases, where indeed the change of the lexicon does lead to communication problems. And one should distinguish these two things. And you cannot distinguish them purely on the basis of the lexica. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm working on that, how one should do that. So one should yeah, have yeah, two yeah, kinds yeah. of incommensurability. Both involve change in lexicon. One leads, does lead to communication problems and all the stuff. Kuhn was so interested in it. But he overgeneralized 
And I only realized that within the last 12 months. So it's a very, so in that sense, I can agree with those, I think, Dick, you said similar things, that yeah, incommensurability is really exaggerated, the semantic part. And in that sense, as I reconstruct that, I can now fully agree mm -hmm. with it. And I think this is an important step forward because Kuhn's prejudice, with, which I also, I think, uh, proliferated a little, at least a little, uh, that should be abandoned and we should have a more nuanced view of what incommensurability, semantic incommensurability mm -hmm. is. That's great. Thank you. I don't think I need to add much to that. I mean, I'll just say that it has indeed been useful to look at lots of history, but that's the puzzle because Kuhn knew an enormous amount of history of science. But with, with Paradigm Monopoly, for example, I find that almost every case that Kuhn didn't look at <laughs> lacks monopoly. So maybe he was selecting uh, without realizing it that much. And uh, uh, the other factor is that he was very heavily focused on physics and astronomy. And even going next door to chemistry ha has been a real education to me. Helmut Heidt. Yes, thank you very much for this very illuminating talk. I have a question for you regarding your justification of the active realism. Uh -huh. um, in particular, since you describe that as a commitment so it's a specific attitude or a specific commitment of people. So there seems to be a normative and psychological dimension. And I would yeah. like to learn a little more about that. Why should we pursue this commitment? Yeah. And the second question connected to that is um, um, I subscribe or, and, and I appreciate your reservations against um, um, paradigm monopoly. But isn't um, the commitment to um, active realism something which has a tendency towards monopoly, paradigm monopoly, because um, it feels like uh, I'm figuring out the true matters of fact, and in, in really being prepared and really being committed to doing that, the inclination is very strong to think, yeah, and the way I do it is the only yeah, 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 successful, yeah. promising way. So, so psychology you, yeah. behind it, it seems to be similar. Thank you. I, I'll do the second one first. I mean, what you just said is precisely the case with standard realism, but not with what I call active realism, right? Because active realism is tempered with Paul's kind of neo-Kantian relaxedness about what kind of thing you're finding out when you're finding out, let's say, truth with the lowercase t, right? But so we uh, no, because, uh, so that comes to the first question. What is this uh, active realism thing and why should we have that commitment? Uh, to me, yes, you're right, it's a normative stance. I do call it normative uh, realism explicitly. And um, what does it consist in? I think it is basically synonymous with empiricism, right? What we want to do in what we call science is find out about the world that we can't control, right? And how do we do it? Uh, well, the pluralist answer is there are many ways of doing it. And that pl pluralism is, is what prevents that slide into your first question, right? And the pluralism is possible only because you recognize that the phenomenal world that you're dealing with isn't the one and only world in itself, right? So I think that all works out, it is, at least if you listen to Paul. Uh, another question by Martin Kayi. I would, I would like to explore the prospects of conservationist pluralism as a, a resource for avoiding Kuhn losses. And it seems to me that there are limits to the strategy if the two approaches in, in question, or the approaches in question more general, are incompatible in a metaphysical sense, so that you, in a sense, you're prevented from adopting the two take. Kuhn's paid example, uh, phlogiston theory and the similarity of metals. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, metals are similar because they all contain the, this, this common uh, ingredient, uh, phlogiston. Mm -hmm. So this is lost when you abandon phlogiston. Would it be an alternative to, to stick to this uh, explanation uh, and, and going on with Lavoisier's chemistry in, other, in all other respects? Well, it doesn't seem to be an option. I mean, because I mean, this is some sort of well, metaphysical incompatibility. Either phlogiston exists or it doesn't. And a similar case uh, is scattering, scattering in mm -hmm. optics, and 
uh, this case was, if I recall correctly, explored by John Worrell. And uh, mm -hmm. the upshot is um, that when people switched from particle optics to wave optics, about 1830, 40, 50, whatever, they, they lost a well-established theory of optical scattering, which, I mean, which is plausible. I mean, can you, you can just um, uh, account for scattering by, by, by thinking of a collision of two particles, a light particle and the, the molecule in the air, something, yeah? So that, that went well. Um, but when you, when you switch, to, when you switch to, to wave optics, I mean, you lose these resources, yeah? And mm -hmm. you, you can't retain them because, in a sense, uh, you, you, you would need to say, well, life is, in a sense, a particle as well, but you couldn't do that to yeah. prior to yeah. quantum mechanics. So, yeah, I mean, there's... Yeah. No, certainly. I, I think the, the way I would see it is that what this kind of pluralism introduces is not quite, as you put it, metaphysical contradiction, but only a semi-metaphysical contradiction, as I put it, right? So in, in following Paul again and, and my own work, I would say phlogiston is real in that phenomenal sense, as is oxygen. Right? The same way we say electrons are, of course, real, but they're really, in another way, just fluctuating states of the quantum field. Right? And we, we take both of those pictures as giving us something true about reality, but not literally expressing the thing in itself. Right? So that, that's how I uh, would be happy to live with this kind of apparent contradiction. And I, I mean, I, I've personally pretty much live with phlogiston now um, because there are free electrons in a way, right? And there are various ways in which you can substantiate, found, ground, any other metaphor you want, the reality of, of these things that our theories talk about. And that's fine if another theory has some other kind of thing that they consider real as long as you both relax a bit and say, uh, well, what, what, what we consider real here within the theory is not the reality in itself. Okay, I, I agree, but this seems to be a position that is somehow confined to hindsight, yeah? I'm, 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 no, I'm, no. I'm, wondering, I'm wondering whether the scientists, the acting scientists, the scientists in the trenches, yeah, could adopt such a position. At least nobody did that, and they, I doubt whether they could do that because there's some sort of commitment to a certain theory that you that you want to show that some things are true and others are wrong. And I mean, this seems to be a distanced position, yeah, when, which you can take a hundred years later. Well, I mean, I'm not sure because I mean, I think if you look at current mm -hmm. physics, say, yeah, uh, there could be the ultimate reality of quantum fields, or it could be. Uh, substantively space time as the gravitation people put it. I, I think these options are open or there could be strings and I think a, a reasonably reflective physicist would admit that we can pursue all these different ways of thinking about nature without saying that with being purely instrumentalist or uh, just one of them must be right in the end and I mean historically I think again looking at the details shows you something very interesting. So Cavendish, right, published a paper in 1784, right? This is the second version of phlogistonism that Alan Musgrave talks about in his paper. And in that paper, he says, yeah, I understand what Lavoisier is saying. I know how to perfectly make sense of things according to his theory. I also know how to make perfect sense of things with my phlogiston theory. And then he says a remarkable thing. Uh, based by two things, but the one thing he says at first is, well, these two are equally good. I'm a conservative kind of guy. I'm not going to change my mind. But he fully acknowledges that Lavoisier's way of conceiving the world makes sense. So what would he have said if you asked him, is oxygen real? I think he would have said, yeah, if you really care about that question, sure. I am a little bit conservative as well, and German, and so I have to keep track of time. There's one last question in the back. So this is a short one, and my question is, who's, who's the pluralist? So uh, in your, uh, let me elaborate a little bit. So can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. 
So, um, with your active realism, you got rid of the uh, option that being pluralist might be it might uh, mean being uh, incoherent somehow, inconsistent, because you can subscribe to different theories uh, uh, because they are phenomenally true, but maybe not in themselves, uh, as the word in themselves mm -hmm. uh, is concerned. But then, so there's, logically there's no problem. But then I think there is some sociological problem in uh, um, thinking about an individual scientist being pluralist, uh -huh. and especially in his mid-career, maybe when he's a student, maybe when he's uh, uh, yes. established, he can be pluralist, but then in his mid-career, he can have some problems. So if the pluralist is, in, is the individual, yeah. Not sure is, if the pluralist is a school master or um, leader of a network of scientists. Not sure. If it is the whole community, then no problem. That's a very good point. Thank you, Matteo. And it goes slightly back to Helmut's original question, so I'll try to tie it back. So the, the answer there is there are different ways of being pluralist and different degrees of it, right? So it could be that a particular individual is simply incapable of entertaining more than one way of doing things at a time. And those people can also be accommodated in the pluralist republic of science. So you can have several paradigms or systems of practice, as I put it, at the same time. And there can be people who just belong to one and they only think like that and that gives them the commitment that they need in order to be scientists as long as then they don't go and burn down the other people, right, and let them do what their narrow-minded monistic way of thinking allows them to do. So that's the basic level, but I think we can rise above that. Uh, so the next level would be to come out occasionally from your monistic cave and link up with the other people doing projects like GPS, these days, engineers do a lot of that. Scientists can do more of that role as well. And then I think it is also possible for an individual to truly think in a pluralist, integrated way. Uh, that may not be everyone's preferred way of life. But I think there are these different degrees of pluralism which can all be accommodated into uh, the general scientific community. Thank you. The bell rang, so I think I should shut up now. Thank you.